was just a good old-fashioned Christmas miracle that a black hole wasn't created when Russell Brand and Ben Shapiro sat down to discuss religion. If these two men fail in their current endeavors, I'm telling you, they could be auctioneers for a living. <laughs> Exhausting. But that is beside the point. The question isn't how fast do they talk. But is what they say about religion true? Both of these men, while being mostly social and political commentators, they do engage in religious discussions. We're about to react to one. Let's see what we can learn, perhaps from, but probably more about Ben Shapiro and Russell Brand. Ben's up first. One of the I think most honest ways to read the Bible is as a document that was given to a particular set of people at a particular time, yep. meaning that you have to look at what it's attempting to transform. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ben. You got half of that right. Biblical hermeneutics starts with, what did the original author intend to say to the original audience? If we come up with a different interpretation, then we have it wrong, because that book, that letter, that gospel, it was aimed at that original audience. However, the Bible wasn't written for the sake of societal transformation per se. The Bible is written that we might know God and enjoy the God who defines himself as, yep, holy, righteous, just, good, patient, merciful, and ultimately, with that little equator sign, which is a B verb, God is love. The Bible is written that we might know him and enjoy him forever. The Bible isn't written so that societies can behave like Pharisees, whitewashed tombs. Let's continue with Ben. Meaning if you look at the slavery in the society surrounding, it's a much more liberalized version of slavery that's in the Bible, and therefore a step toward the abolition of slavery, which is exactly how it's been read by, you know, every abolitionist preacher in the, in the 19th century. Yeah, I don't know for sure what he's saying, but it sounded a bit like a trajectory hermeneutic. The Bible, they kind of address this issue, and it appears to be getting more sophisticated, which means that when it closed with the book of Revelation, the trajectory continues. Even though we don't have divine instruction, we continue to imagine God must have been moving in that direction. That's a trajectory hermeneutic. Now, um, for my money, it ain't the way to read the Bible. And so the Bible says that if you want to stay, then we take an awl and we put it through your ear and we give you essentially an ear piercing. Okay, so it's, it's a punishment. The idea is that you should have gone free. There's something wrong with you if you decide to stay in, in bondage. No, it was actually a physical contract. When the individual said, yes, I am with you for life, how did the world, how did those two individuals know that that deal had been cut with a physical symbol, which incidentally is not uncommon for covenants in the Old Testament and in Middle Eastern culture, by the way, we still have remnants of those physical signs of a covenant. It's called your wedding ring. You put on a physical symbol to let the world know that you are in a till death do you part agreement. Yeah. What Judaism says is that you are a you are a human being with the capacity for great good and the capacity for great evil, right? You have literally yeah. Yeah. the Yetzer Hara and the Yetzer Hatov. You have a desire for good and you have a desire for evil, and these two things are battling in you literally at all times. And what your job is to do is, regardless of what you believe, you do the thing. The thing that is in front of you is the thing that you do. Right, so we have this arcane set of rules, and this arcane set of rules is made to reify the presence of God in your life. And even I mean, what? He's wearing a yarmulke, and he's calling his holy book an arcane set of rules. That's a bit mysterious. Your life, and even if you don't recognize that's what it's doing, by you doing these things over and over, you're cultivating virtue through action. So it's, it's like you reach God by doing the thing, whereas I think that Christianity almost through comes at it backwards. And through ceremony. Uh, it's, it's not backwards, though. The Bible has the word heart in it page after page. 600 times it's used in the Old Testament alone. God is interested not merely in the external outworkings of the heart. He's actually interested in the inner man. That's something that we heard Dennis Prager try to propose, that, hey, for Jewish people, it's just about what we do. It's not about what we think. The problem is, the Bible. As a man speaks, so he is. What comes out of the mouth is found in the heart. 
So the Bible, not just Christianity, but the Bible is big on the inner man. Let's see what Ben has in store for us next. You know, I think Christianity comes at it from the other way, and there's a reward in it, and there's a risk in it. The reward in it, Christianity says you believe the thing, therefore you do the thing. Judaism says you do the thing, therefore you believe the thing. Wow. Right, so Judaism... You take the prescription, and you will experience God. Right. Christianity, experience God, experience Christ And because in you're heart, doing that, now, then you'll do the good thing. Okay, that is definitely different. That sounds more like Judaism is cognitive behavioral therapy. Just do it, repeat it, and then it becomes a pattern, it becomes a habit, and that becomes what you are. And while there is certainly some truth in that, the more you practice a certain behavior, the more likely you are to instinctively do that behavior. Christianity says, mm -mm -mm -mm. out of the heart, the mouth speaks. It is the inner man that motivates the external behavior. And this wouldn't be an issue for Ben or for me, frankly, if the Bible were not so insistent on the desire of God to see the inner man change, not just external behavior. I mean, the, the, the way that I've started to think about, you know, the, I, I keep going back to what is the ultimate purpose of human life. Yeah. You know, the, the way that I like to think about it, and I think that because I, because I think it's true, because I'm always right, of course. Um, but it's, but it's, he is a talk if, show If you go host. to a cemetery and you look at the headstones, that's the purpose of human life. Every headstone says the same thing. Beloved father, beloved brother, beloved mother, rabbi, priest, right? Particular roles, teacher, right? Things that, that, other, that you did, roles that you filled for other people. You know what it doesn't say? How you felt about yourself. Uh, yeah, okay. But what is the chief end of man that doesn't answer it? Is it my job description? Is it how many children I bore? Or is it something more transcendent? This is why all of the confessions agree the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's a far more transcendent purpose. What Ben is describing is pretty earthbound and frankly, not very uh, purposeful. But now we fast forward. And when I say fast forward, uh, that means Russell Brand's going to talk and he's even faster. And, and and I feel that my optimism, you know, as opposed to that your um, uh, declared pessimism, is that if I do my best as a <laughs> spiritual man, it's going to make the world better. Well, that's sure. But that ultimately is not the chief end of man. Furthermore, the Bible indicates both New and Old Testament. Nobody does good. No, not one. Yes, a pagan can leave the world a better place than that which he found when he entered the world. But ultimately, what does that have to do with God? Now, this conversation, it went on longer, clearly, and maybe, possibly, there might have been more clarity. But I have to confess what I heard, with all due respect to two very intelligent men, individuals who might be smart politically, they might even be able to study history and regurgitate it well, but they don't have something that a Christian has. If you're a Christian, you have something that these two men do not, the mind of Christ. A born-again believer has the mind of Christ. These two fellows, fascinating. They are interesting to listen to, no doubt. They can be educational. And yet, because they lack the mind of Christ, they are going to be swinging and missing more times than they're going to even hit a single what is the moral to this story? If you listen to these two guys, make sure you have your mind of Christ filter on, because when they speak about religious, social, and moral issues, um, they're coming at it from a totally different place, and it's probably, probably not going to be right. Discuss! The mission of TMAI is to equip and train national pastors and church leaders to rightly divide the Word of God and to disciple their congregations in the truth of God's Word. The Masters Academy International filling empty pulpits with men who are trained to rightly divide the Word of Truth because they are trained at many seminaries in 18 countries around the globe. Would you please consider adopting a seminary? Wretched.org slash pastor. Who are you? Who, who? 
Who, who, I really want to know who are you? Why? Because Wretched is hiring. And if you have organizational skills, if you have marketing experience, we want to know who are you? Please visit wretched.org slash careers. If you'd like to work in a high energy place that propagates the gospel to the lost and seeks to encourage the saints by teaching theology and you'd love to apply your skills to this ministry so that God can be glorified, then tell us, who are you? Who, 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 wretched.org slash careers.